Good to be back with everybody. And uh, how many of you watched the services this week? Appreciate that. They were really, they were commensurate with what I'm going through today. I'll tell you that. Okay? And, um, I mean, God just mopped up stuff everywhere this week. And um, it was good. It was good to be part of it. It was good to see it. And um, I wish I'd, I feel bad today emotionally because I feel like I should give you more than what I'm giving you today. So my apologies for that. But it's what happens <clears throat> when you love people and they love you back. We're here for the long haul. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this day. Lord, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Because I know, Lord, what's behind me. And I'm glad it's there. And I know, Lord, what's ahead of me. And I'm glad it's there. And Father, where I'm going is ahead and not behind. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you, Lord, for where Lisa and I were this week. Pray, Lord, you bless that church this week. Bless them, Lord, uh, from here on out. Thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us together. Pray, Lord, you bless their pastor and his family. And, uh, Lord, just thank you for what, uh, what you did this week. Thank you for these that have gathered here this morning, those that are gathered with us online. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just bless in spite of, not because of, Father, just a lot of people today not doing well. Lord, maybe the ones that are doing okay physically may not be the ones doing okay spiritually. So, Lord, one way or the other, the devil's going to try his, his best at all of us. And Father, his best is not as good as your worst. Father, I thank you, Lord, for being that way, and I thank you for being the kind of God that you are to us and for us. Father, I thank you for this church, and uh, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them today and bless each and every heart, bless each and every aching body, and Father, but more so, Father, be with the, those who are weary in mind and heart today. Because, Lord, they'll need it. They'll need it for days to come. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless your word today. Bless these people. And, Lord, just help us, Lord, in our worst day, in our best day. Father, that you'd always be our God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I wasn't kidding you. Have a seat. If I could find my Bible. Thank you, Alicia and Pam. Alicia's sick today. I, um, I've had days where I didn't feel good, where my bones ached, and today's one of those days, but on top of it, my, uh, for some reason, the devil just climbed all over me as a result of that. And um, and then, on top of that, I'm not I'm feeling worse as time goes on. So what I want you to do before someday, turn to Judges chapter six. Judges chapter six. I labored last night over this message, and in two minutes. God gave me the message, and I bawled like a baby before I went to bed last night. This is about Gideon. And um, when I started preaching about Gideon, I didn't feel like Gideon. Today, I feel like Gideon. <clears throat> and Gideon is the kind of person that I think a lot of us feel like today. Certainly, a lot of us are like him. Uh, in that we never feel like we are the ones that God should be using. 
We feel like maybe God ought to pick somebody better than us. Somebody better emotionally. Can I get amen on that one? Somebody better physically. Somebody better spiritually. We feel like God should have picked somebody else. And um, there was something that I want to draw your attention to, and I'm going to read this whole chapter because I just don't feel like it today. But um, turn to Judges chapter 6. Let's, I want to start reading in verse 17. If you don't remember uh, what I preached before, join the club because I don't either. It's a good thing we got it recorded. Um, but no, it, it's, about, it's about Gideon being the lowest that there was. And that's who God picked. He did not pick the best. He did not pick the richest family. He did not pick the richest man of the family or the best of the sons. He picked who he knew he could work with. And as I'd studied Gideon's life before, and I saw what I'm going to share with you today. Um, this is probably a sermon years in the making. And I know what I, the Lord showed me last night. I may or may not be able to get out to you today the way I got it last night. But I'm glad I got it last night because I needed it. The Judges chapter 6 verse 17. <clears throat> Gideon is talking with the angel of the Lord. And that angel of the Lord has told Gideon that he's going to call him, he's going to use him to put down the Midianites. The Midianites had held Israel captive. So I want you to think of this morning, I want you to think of somebody beside yourself. Okay? I want you to think of somebody that needs you to be strong on a day when you don't feel like being strong. I want you to think of people whose deliverance has not yet come, but God has chosen you for their deliverance. So maybe you have a wife or a husband, a mom and dad, son and daughter, grandchildren, other family members, friends, or even a whole nation. Our nation is in bondage. How many of you believe that one? Say amen. <clears throat> and maybe on a day like today, this is how I feel. I'm going to be totally honest with you. When I woke up this morning, I was angry. I was angry because I didn't feel good. I didn't want to leave, didn't want to go anywhere, wanted to stay home. And I thought, well, everybody else gets to stay home and they don't feel good. How come I don't have to get to stay home and I don't feel good? And then I heard this gentle voice saying, but you're the pastor. Get up. It was my wife, but it was a gentle voice nonetheless. But it's, it's, I needed to hear it. But no matter how you feel, no matter how you are, Somebody else needs you. So Gideon's having this conversation that he doesn't want to have, and he's not really believing what he's hearing. And he wants proof. I want you to get this now. He wants proof that he's talking to the right God. Okay? So verse 17, I'm going to read this. He said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. I want you to get that. He's needing proof that he's talking to the right God. Okay? So he says in verse 18, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. I want you to underline the phrase, Bring forth my present. Underline that. That's important. That's the important part of the message. Okay? 
in case I forget what I'm talking about here in about 10 minutes, you'll remind me because you'll underline it. Said it before thee, and he said, I will tarry, the angel said, I will tarry until thou come again. So verse 19, Gideon went in, made ready a kid, and eleven cakes of an ephah of flour. Now a kid is not one of his children, just... Because I know there's days when you don't mind giving those up either, amen? He made ready a kid, an unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. Somebody look up an ephah. How much is an ephah? Boy, Google handy and having a church in twenty first century. Amen. How much is an ephah of flour? A bushel. I want you to get this. This actually makes it better. He's making cakes out of a whole bushel basket of flour. Now, ladies, just a guess. How many cakes? Now, I'm not talking about birthday cakes. You know how they made flatbreads. How many pieces of flatbread do you think could be made out of a bushel, not a bushel basket of wheat, a bushel basket of flour? Don't say a lot. Come on, you old baker ladies. I mean, you baker ladies. At least 500 cakes. Does that sound about right? If you had to feed an army, you'd start with a bushel basket of flour, would you not? That's some present. That is some present. So, he made ready the kid. Verse 19, Gideon went in, made ready a kid. Un unleavened cakes of Nephi flour, the flesh... He put in a basket. He took the, the child goat and he boiled it. He cooked it. And he took the flesh, put it in a basket. Then he took the broth, put it in a pot, big pot. So he's got the unleavened cakes and he's got the meat from this goat and he's got all this broth. Aren't you glad I'm going to let you out early? Because it's making me hungry. So he brought it, and he brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. So here you go. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock. And then, somebody read out loud, you can all do it if you want to, what he said to do with the broth. That is the stupidest thing in the world to do with broth. I can think of much better things to do with broth. Gravy comes to mind. Right? Stew. Anything. Put it in a seal of meal. Put it in a freezer. Save it for later. But that's not what he did. Who told him to pour out the broth? Now remember, he's testing to see whether this is the right God or not. There's a reason for this. See, so pour out the broth, and he did so. Verse 21. Lord, help me to preach this now. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Now, Tell me, as of this moment, where are the cakes, the meat, and the broth? Gone. Totally gone. Non-existent. Don't exist anymore. Because the fire consumed the cakes, the meat. He poured out the broth on the ground. Have you ever tried to scoop up? Spilled broth or water from a bucket that you dumped out on the ground. Have you ever tried to put that water back in the bucket? It's impossible. 
Why did this angel, why did this angel tell Gideon to do that? Gideon's asking, are you the right God? Am I hearing this from the right one? Remember, Gideon is the kind of guy that he doesn't just, he's not what you would say was one of these men full of faith. And yet, he's in Hebrews 11. His name is recorded in the Faith Hall of Fame. He's not one of these guys that just, I mean, he reads a verse. And, yeah, amen, that's it. That's Boy, that's it. That's going to run me for years now. That's not the kind of guy he is. And to be honest with you, that's not the kind of guy I am on a lot of days. So, what kind of God is this? I mean, he took a kid. Kids, if you've ever sold cows, ever sold cattle, sometimes the calves can sell for way more than the adult cattle. Why? The potential is there, right? The potential is there to make... I mean, you're looking at a kid and you're going, man, there's something in that. I could sell this for a pretty good price. And you hope to sell it for a high price because you never know what could happen to it after that. And sell it while you got it. And sometimes a kid, even this, even, even in human terms, a child, the loss of a child. A lot harder to deal with than the loss of an adult. Amen? So he's taken this kid, prepared it, a whole bushel basket full of flowers were the cakes and the broth, and he was told by this God to pour out the broth, waste it on the ground, and then to put the cakes and the kid on a rock, and then whoosh, gone. Just like that. And then, oh, by the way, as soon as that was done, then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. What kind of God is this? What kind of God, after I've done all of this, what kind of God would take my very best and just destroy it just like that? Just burn it up into nothing, tell me to pour it out on the ground like it was, like it was wastewater. What kind of God would do that? And then look at verse 22. 22 is the number for revelation, by the way. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built... An altar there unto the Lord and called it, what did he call that? Jehovah Shalom. What do you think those two words mean? We know what Jehovah means. What does Shalom mean? Peace. What that means is, in Jehovah is our peace. Unto this day, it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Now I'm going to try to say what I'm going to, I, I'm holding back. You would not, ha, you have no idea how much emotion I'm holding back. So I'm him hoeing around getting ready to say what I'm going to say. And it may not mean as much to you as it does to me on a day like this, but it means an awful lot to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you read it first. Hang on. Turn to First Timothy 6. While you're turning there, can I ask you a favor? Is that a yes? Yes, that I can ask the favor, or can I have the favor before I ask it? Can I have the rest of the day off? Appreciate it. You aren't going to say no now anyway. You're saying, I'm sick of this already, I'm tired of that. I want you to read verse 7 to yourself. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, I want you to read verse 7 to yourself. Now, have you read it? So here's what I'm going to say to you. Whose kid was it? Whose broth was it? Whose water was it? Whose flower? Grown on God's earth with God's sunshine and God's air. The sacrifice that we made in life. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that everybody in this room has made some sort of sacrifice in life. I'm not belittling that. I'm not saying anything that you haven't done enough. I don't think I've ever told this church you've never done enough. We've all made sacrifices. We might have sacrificed great things, but the truth of it is, they weren't ours to begin with. But even, even at that, the emotional toll that a sacrifice brings upon us personally is great, and there's no getting around that. So I'm not belittling that either. We may have made great sacrifices in life and gained something by those sacrifices. But raise your hand. If you sacrificed for the benefit of the entire world, past, present, and future, Certainly not me. It was never about it was never about our sacrifice to begin with. Never was. God didn't ask me to die for the whole world, past, present, and future. He just asked me to give what I had, which we sing the song. Oh, which one is it? The old rugged cross. Is it the old rugged cross? Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. We certainly have brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. So the real God that would not... See, Gideon said, let me bring you my present. Because he wanted to know if he was talking to the right God or not. The wrong God... Would have taken his kid, his broth, his cakes, and then demanded more. And would have never stopped demanding more. We've all served that God. Pretty sure we all have. And there was no end to do the demands that he made. But Gideon knew that he had the real God. Because this God took what Gideon offered and he turned it into nothing because this God knew where Gideon got it. He got it from that God to begin with and it was his to do with what he pleased and so Gideon realized then that he was not giving a gift to his God. That it was his God 
who was going to give his gift to Gideon. Did I say that right? See, it just hit me deeper last night. Then I was able to say it today. In the long scheme of things, I've done nothing. And Christ, for me, for the whole world, has done everything. Our sacrifice might mean a little to us, but Christ's sacrifice means everything to me. And I wouldn't even be here today without it. Let's bow our heads. There's a lot more to the message than what I was able to say today, obviously. Or else I just know how to stretch them way out. But in <clears throat> what is little, let there be much.